So I'm going to jump right into this video talking about dioramas. Maybe you are a complete novice, you've never built one before, but you want to make that leap. Maybe you've built many dioramas over time, but you want to try something a little bit different. And if you look online, there are countless video tutorials showing you the step-by-step -step process for how to complete one of these projects. Usually it's step one, gather these materials. Step two, measure this, cut that. Step three, glue it here, paint it that way. That's great. But I'm going to recommend what I call the most important step, step zero. That's going to be you determining what's going to be the intended purpose of this diorama. Because that's also going to help you determine what materials are going to work best for this project. If you look online, the vast majority of most dioramas are typically going to be made out of lightweight materials. Um, it's going to be cardstock, cardboard, foam core. Insulation foam is probably the most common. The, um, the great thing about them is that they're lightweight. They're easy to acquire. They are usually easy to cut. Um, and they take a lot of detail. If you know what you're doing, you can put all kinds of intricate details on it and they look beautiful. I get tons of inspiration by seeing a lot of these dioramas that are foam based. Um, and if you stick a few figures on them and then put it on a shelf, they look great. But it's not necessarily something that's intended to throw on the floor for little Jim Bob to come in and start playing away with it. The lifespan is probably not going to be that long for it with that type of material. But here again, if it's display only, they look great. If it's something that you're wanting to actually play with, either for yourself or for your kids, you're going to need to do something a little bit hardier, more than likely, for it to last. I mean, you're going to be putting hours, days, weeks, months, years of work into this thing, and you don't want it ruined by either you fat fingering it and destroying it, or a kid that's just trying to have fun, or for the family cat to come in and nap on it, and it's destroyed. Now, the word diorama itself is sort of a blanket term. There's a lot of little projects that can sit underneath that umbrella. You have anything from a model train display with a painted a mural of the sky with a mountain range with Bosco's Farmer's Market and Sheriff Felix's police station. All of that makes for a beautiful display, but it's a display. It's meant to be looked at, not touched. Only the builder himself knows all the weak spots. He knows how much work he's put into it. He doesn't want some little kid coming in there and poking around on it, but it is a diorama. And then you have things such as uh, dollhouses. Dollhouses are usually made of hardier materials, particularly wood, and uh, these are things that can last for ages. They, they are usually passed down from generation to generation, and they are amazing. They're usually, in most cases, intended for uh, as girl toys, but I remember as a kid getting tons of inspiration, wanting to play with one of these things, and being able to put like a Michael Myers in it, chasing a little Jamie Lee Curtis up and down the stairs and into the attic. Um, so that's another diorama but it's meant to be played with. Uh, you have museum displays. These are things that don't touch them, but it's a, it could be anything from a one-to-one -one scale, life-size dinosaur pooping in the ferns and eating this, um, or it could be a large cityscape, um, little miniature cities showing some uh, historical um, uh, location. These are things that, here again, not meant to be touched, but the intricate detail, you could just stare at it for hours. Um, movie displays, mov movie dioramas. These are things that, um, here again, can be one-to-one, uh, -one, life-size scale. Um, and it's for the actors to uh, sort of immerse themselves into that, that uh, scenario. It could be just a facade. It could be that building is just the front wall of the building, but it looks incredible. Um, or they could be miniatures. Here again, it's meant for your eyes. A lot, of, uh, a lot of movie miniatures don't last over time, but there are a few that were built with hardier materials that don't break down, um, and there's, they still exist to today. So it all bas basically boils down to what these things are made out of that allows them to last. Now, the next option, and there, there's a lot of other you know, uh, uh, diorama subcategories that exist out there, but I'm going to jump to the one that I, I believe is most important, and that it would be play sets. 
play sets in most cases are going to be made out of harder plastic, sometimes a mix of cardboard and plastic. Um, and these are things that um, they're built and designed and intended on being played with. So when I was a kid growing up in the 80s, I thought play sets were one of the most magical things. It gave us kids the ability to recreate scenes from movies. We had the action figures. And instead of just sticking them on the kitchen counter, now we had something to actually immerse themselves in. And um, we could recreate the scenes or we could come up with our own um, own scenarios, our own adventures. And, uh, you know, back in the 80s, the play sets were really, for the most part, pretty well built. I mean, they, they lasted over the years as long as you took care of them. And then up until the, um, you know, 90s and 2000s, play sets kind of took a back seat. Um, almost to the point where they weren't even in the car anymore. And it was just action figures. That was it. So you kind of relied on making your own. And that's what kind of sparked me into making my own uh, playset world was um, the stuff wasn't available anymore for the most part. And, uh, you know, what we grew up with in the 80s, like I'd mentioned earlier, was, you know, the ones that would have like maybe a um, hard plastic base to it with a cardboard backdrop. So it was kind of like half and half. It was really amazing, but it was a little bit cheapy on the back end of it. Um, and, you, you know, over the years, uh, when you find these play sets, typically only the plastic base portion is still going to be intact. The, the cardboard backdrop, unless in, you know, special circumstances, uh, those cardboard backdrops are going to be completely destroyed, um, ripped up, peeling off. They don't exist anymore. You have to look online to get a reprinting of it. But um, but it worked for what it was. And um, but the, the, the material, the hardier material of the playset is what usually survived over the years. Um, you know, one example, the classic of the uh, Star Wars Creature Cantina by Kenner. This thing was amazing. And, you know, here you had the hard plastic base with the uh, cardboard backdrop to it. And uh, yeah, I'm lucky to still have this. And uh, another playset, the Indiana Jones Well of Souls. This one was neat because there was no cardboard involved with it. And typically all of these pieces are still going to hold up. It's still the, the hard plastic base with the, the, the backdrop of the, uh, the breakaway stone wall. These things are great. And they last longer um, than some of the ones with the, uh, the, the cardboard pieces. Here again, if you... If you just are using it for a display, it, it'll last forever. But through many decades of kids playing with it, that cardboard is going to get tore up. So I remember as a kid wanting to build my own play sets. And I went the route that most kids did and just used cardboard boxes. Even the, even the uh, Kenner TV commercials would show kids using Dixie cups or whatever they you know had on hand to be creative and make your own um your own scenarios. And, uh, and, you know, of course I used, uh, like most kids did cardboard boxes, uh, TV boxes, microwave boxes, whatever I had on hand. I think one time I even had a refrigerator box and that was great because I could play inside of it. And, uh, and, and these things worked great for what they were. And, um, of course they're not going to last over the years. I mean, the, the cardboard's going to start sagging and everything, but, uh, th they're, they were pretty great. They were great disposable play sets. And uh, once I got older, I was still collecting, and I noticed online that people had started um, delving into using uh, sheets of foam core. And if you you know cut it precisely and glue it together, and and you could come up with these amazing displays. And I would make a few, um, but I quickly realized that they were amazing and awesome for dioramas, but for play sets, they were going to be fragile. Um, depending on the weight of the figures that you put on it or the, the ships, the vehicles, these things could easily get dinged up, have divots in it. They could get damaged. So I was looking for another alternative. And uh, since I had woodworking experience, I had an ample supply of wood at my disposal. I tried my hand at making wood buildings, and it worked really well. And uh, the great thing about wood is that you could spray paint it. I love working with spray paint. Uh, you can't really do that with foam materials because that chemical reaction, that foam is going to, uh, it's going to start degrading. It's going to eat up almost immediately once that spray gets put on it. It's the aerosol. Um, but with wood, you can spray paint it all day long. Um, 
so it works out great for that. And, uh, you know, eventually have kids and, um, you know, take them to Toys R Us. And when they're little, they want to play with the Thomas the Tank Engine, you know, section that they would have, the Imaginarium section at, at, at Toys R Us. And um, I noticed that they had these play tables, these train set play tables. And they were out for the whole public to be able to play on. They were, they were trying to sell, you know, most of the public on it. And it seemed to work really well. I mean, these these tables were big enough to be able to accommodate six, seven, eight, ten kids wrapped around the table. They all had access to all the little play features. And it got me thinking, uh, you know, what if I did something along those lines? And I kind of shelved the idea for a while. But eventually, you know, my wife and I did get our kids when they were toddlers, a um, one of these, you know, tables. It was probably the Bobo version of the table. It wasn't the actual expensive Thomas the Tank Engine table. And, uh, and it worked really well. You know, the kids played with it. They loved it. And, uh, once they, you know, their interest kind of waned on it a little bit, I, uh, I stole that damn table from my kids and I realized, all right, this is a perfect base for me to be able to put my, my wooden buildings on this thing. This is my, my main structure. And, um, that's what rocket station is built on top of is one of these Bobo Thomas, the tank engine, um, play tables. That's what all of this is with the drawers and all that. And I'm able to store things, you know, within those those drawers. And the great thing about it, this thing, you know, holds a ton of weight. They they were built and designed to be able to accommodate kids in case they were climbing on top of it. The thing, the whole thing wasn't going to collapse. So this table is probably supporting, uh, and I beefed it up a little bit, but it is probably supporting. I, I'm guessing probably 600, 800 pounds of of all of this wood mess on top of it, and it's working really well. It's not rickety. It won't, you know, it it won't shake it or, or topple over. And um, I've been very impressed with it. So using that as a base, it, it gave me the ability to kind of, instead of spilling a place set out all over the floor, it gave me this centralized area that I could focus all of the structure on top of it. Because I had no idea that rock gut was going to spread up the walls and down, up to the ceiling and then coming down and all that. I just wanted it to be on one little accessible play table. And, uh, and even then I didn't know it was going to be, you know, going higher and higher, but, um, but I was thoroughly impressed with the idea of it. And I realized it gave me 360 degrees of accessibility with this. Cause I built this, you know, for my kids to initially start playing with it. And then I basically took it over and I played with it. So, um, the great thing about having it as a structure like this, a platform, um, is that it? It's not directly on the floor, so you're not crouched down, and um, it's easily accessible for the height of it. And you get multiple levels, you know, with it for for the the street level, you know, up here, and then all the little intermediate levels, and then even lower levels. When I started tacking on other, you know, platforms and other buildings down from it, I could go lower. I can go higher and lower, and have all this stuff in between, and being able to access it all the way around. That was the cool thing about it. You know, I, I I wasn't sure if I was going to take this thing and stick it up against a wall. If you take a playset like this, a platform, and stick it up against the wall, it keeps it out of the room. And I understand, you know, about having um, space constraints, um, but it it only gives you access to that one side, or maybe the side, the other side of it, and maybe this other side. Um, but it limits what you can do that's on that wall side. So it's sort of like um, the massive train sets that you see, usually they're kind of, because of space reasons, they're tucked up against a wall. That gives you the ability to paint on the wall that skyline or have mountains or whatever, but it does limit what you're able to access over there. Since train sets like that aren't usually meant to be touched on and accessed, it works great for display purposes. But for a play set, you really want to be able to go all the way around. And that was the great thing about it. So when I started designing this, I made it right here in this one uh, basic corner of the room because I've got all of that whole area, you know, available to me. Was that it gave the kids and myself the ability to walk around it, and uh, and I could put all the details, you know, all the way 360 degrees. I can take ships. The kids can come in here and actually do, you know, flybys around it, and um, and that's what gives you know, all of these play sets like this, more depth. It makes it feel and look like an actual city. And um, 
And that way you're not concentrating just on that one side. But really, it, it's going to depend on what you have available to you in the space that you're able to work in. That's the big um, the big thing of it, because I, I, I do get, you know, those complaints from a lot of people like, you know, you have this available to you, this space to be able to do this. You know, it's great that you're able to to build this much with it. But I, I have a small closet. I have a small bedroom. I have a small, you know, uh, collectibles room. I, d I don't have that available space. So you really have to get creative with what you have available for you with that. But like I was mentioning, everything started with this platform. Basically, one of these. I found this one at a thrift store for 13 bucks. It's um, the cool thing about this one is that it actually collapses. It folds in on itself. You could take the the uh, floor panels off, and uh, the whole thing folds flat, and you can stack it, you know, behind a couch or under a bed uh, to keep it out of the way. So I picked this up once I saw it. So cheap. Um, this is a kid craft version, I believe, and um, the great thing about it is it gives me the ability to have a sister station to Rotgut. I'm probably going to turn it into some sort of um, refueling station, something that's away from the city. I figure if you're going to have a city like this, a hodgepodge slum, that um, that maybe it'd be uh, safe to be able to keep all the fuel, you know, away from the main city. So that was my idea, you know, with it. Now I'm still working on it. I still have bits and pieces that I'm going to be uh, adding to it. So a lot of folks will ask me, um, how do you get started, you know, with this? I, I, let's say that you do have a, a maybe a coffee table or you have a, a small area that you can be able to build something on, some sort of playset. set. Um, maybe space is still an issue, but you can keep it kind of contained. But how do you get this to look like this, you know? I didn't draw anything to begin with. I always say that I kind of let the city build itself. It always starts, you know, with an idea. And then from there, you just start, you know, one building at a time. Um, you know, maybe you might have some sort of fueling containers. Um, maybe you might have some sort of stacks. And with Rocket, I did the same thing. I just built one building, built another one, built another one, and then just kept at it until I could kind of see the spaces in between these buildings to see what they were going to do, how much space they were going to allow me to be able to still access. Same thing with the, the I refer back to the, um, the, the train station. If it's in an area that you can't access, you know, there's not much of a play set. It's, it's, it's back to being just a display. You can set up the figures, take pictures and all that. But if you're still wanting a, a play set, you're still, the, the empty areas are going to be just as important as the filled in areas because you want to be able to get in there and actually move around, move your hands around, get, the, you know, even if it's just for kids, a space available for them to be able to do that. Because otherwise they're going to be hunched over trying to access something. They're going to knock something over. You're going to knock something over. Um, so remember that with spacing of whatever you decide to do. Before I locked any of this down, I had the buildings you know, set up and I kept moving them around until I realized, okay, this works, this works, this works. What do I have space in between to be able to add even more? And then that's, you know, once I got those locked in, then I was able to add staircases and catwalks and, and landing platforms, things of that nature. So you never know. You never know what these things are going to do. And then I could start with a building. These are these are the buildings I make. And, um, you know, you just decide what works best. Does it work best like this? Can you turn it around? Whatever the case may be. You know, is it better to have the buildings separated? Maybe I have something like that. Maybe I could turn it like this, like a store. Maybe they uh, land on the landing platform, come over here and get a taco. Um, maybe I'll take another building, stick it on top. Then you start building up with height of it. Um, maybe I decide to take this one and turn it like this. 
and then maybe add another building out from it. I don't know. And then I, maybe I got another building and uh, maybe I can put that one up here if it'll fit. Yeah. So I could do something like that. Maybe they need, um, you know, some sort of uh, communications. So you put a, a radar dish there. Maybe they need some sort of defense. So I might move these around. And then put a tower. You know, it, it, it all comes together. You just you just have to build the individual pieces and then just take your time. Don't force it. Just take your time. Let it build itself. Because I, I did when I did all of this, I did not intend to think of it as a city. I thought of it like, um, you know, I mentioned all the time people ask me, you know, where I get inspiration from. I watched a lot of Deadwood. I love Deadwood. And you, if you watch these Westerns, these little small Western towns, um, you got to imagine how did they start? They all started with, you know, a camp, a building, another building, another building. And then eventually they had spaces between those buildings. They saw where the street was going to go. So it starts building itself and developing itself from there. And then you just you just let it take its own life, you know, with it. You can move them around, shift them around until you decide where you want to lock them down, if you want to lock them down. It could be where you want to keep it modular and be able to, you know, turn these things different ways um, to accommodate because you could change the city at any time. And then you, that way you have room for your, uh, you know, for your ships. They come along, land here, drop down, unload their spice, whatever, come get a taco, shoot some bad guys. And then you just have fun with it. And then you could take it all back down, tuck it away, out of the way, underneath a bed, in a closet, whatever the case may be, and then reassemble it again. So if you're able to build these kind of things, and if you're not, definitely support the people that can build them. You know, look online. It doesn't have to be me. There's a lot of guys that build some amazing, amazing structures or customs. Definitely support what they're doing. Look around, find somebody that makes something in a style that you like. And, you know, talk to them or, or just buy what they have available from. I stay in, this is my full time job making these kind of, you know, custom buildings and stuff. And um, I barely have time for myself to be able to make, you know, the things I want to. Um, there's a lot of people out there that want this kind of stuff. So if you're not able to build these things, if you don't have the means or the knowledge, but you got the cash, then talk to these people. Let them like their artistry be able to help you, you know. And, and like with me, I don't do too many custom builds. You know, if somebody comes to me and they say that they want like an apocalyptic hospital, you know, ruins, I don't do that kind of stuff so much anymore. It's, it's, it's the, the client kind of tells me a lot of the design process anymore. I do, I build what I like to build, you know, and then and if folks like it, great. If they want to buy from it, you buy it, great. Um, but my stuff does sell and it, it, it does really well. And I just have fun making it. So if, if folks don't like it, that's great. I'll just take it and put it somewhere, you know, within this. Um, but, you know, don't don't get too, um, you know, if you if you are making this stuff for yourself, um, don't get discouraged. You know, just just keep at it and and have fun with it. That's the biggest thing. These are toys, you know, it, it's it, it's not surgery. It, it's nothing that's going to um you know, really affect the world in any way, but it'll bring, you know, uh, some sort of joy to your world to be able to create these, these, um, these worlds that you, that you're doing and, um, just have fun with it. That's the, that's the, the best advice I can give you with any of this. A lot of guys collect toys. A lot of guys collect, uh, action figures. You know, the way I see it, anybody can go down to Walmart, pick something off the shelf, come home, and then stick it on a shelf in their house. That's their collection. There's nothing wrong with that. I did that for years. It just eventually I wanted more. I, I, I saw things that were in packages uh, on display. They look great. I was, I was happy. I had a lot of pride with my collection, and I, I didn't get rid of it. I still have it all, but I had even more fun when I started ripping that shit open and actually realizing how much artistry went behind the design of these toys. You know, there were some toys that look great in the packaging. You open them up, it was a piece of shit. You know, that something was wrong with it. Kneecaps were falling off or whatever it may be. Um, you know, 
realize that these things, these these toys aren't just things in a package. You know, that, that there is a lot of work that went into them, a lot of artistry, um, even even though they are, you know, mass produced toys. Go out there and look around. And if you're you're frustrated with Star Wars toys, look at some of the other independent toy makers out there. There's guys that are making some incredible, incredible things. And even though they're not Star Wars, you could turn them into a Star Wars uh, um, you know, character. You you could you could easily pop their head off, pop another one on. I do it all the time. Acid Rain is my absolute favorite toy line. Uh, I love Star Wars, but I really, really love Acid Rain. There's a lot of other uh, independent toy makers out there that make stuff. Marauders, incredible. What they're able to give the consumer as far as like all the individual uh, parts and pieces, it's incredible. I don't know of too many other toy lines that have ever been able to do that where you could go down and, and get a little pouch. You could just buy a little pouch. You know, if you need 18 of them, if you need a thousand of these little pouches, they've got sheets and, and, and holsters and all that kind of stuff. These are the great things that I'll use to deck out, you know, the characters. I'll get the, you know, Star Wars characters and they'll be rather plain. I'll load them out with a bunch of pouches. They look amazing, you know, put a little brown paint on them, gritty them up, and they look like they're ready for, you know, a battle. Um, you could have a little alien, you know, snaggletooth, um, um, you know, mercenary. Uh, you could have a, a, all kinds of uh, spice smugglers, whatever you want. The main thing is get creative with this stuff. Have fun with it. A lot of guys get frustrated with their collections because they're always relying on what, like, you know, the big toy makers are providing for them. There's a whole other world out there of things that you can create for yourself, whether it's action figures, whether it's vehicles, whether it's buildings. And, um, you know, anybody can take a show, a, a, a action figure and stick it on the kitchen counter. Uh, there it is. It's it's Cara Dune sitting on a kitchen counter. But if you are able to open her up, see what she's able to do, have her walking around this this city and interacting you know with your other figures hopping onto a, a transport it takes on a whole new life you realize you know these things are, are far more fun than than they are when you're leaving them in the box um just have fun so let's say that you are in a situation where you don't have a whole lot of space you don't have the ability to make an, an entire space port in a spare bedroom or your collectibles room whatever the case may be it's just it's just tight for you um don't let that be an excuse to keep you from being creative. That's that's the trick of it. You have to be creative with this to come up with a scenario that does work for you. Um, so like with the buildings that I make, one inspiration I got was from babushka dolls, the Russian nesting dolls. You know, you have one, a big one. You open it up. There's another one. You open it up. There's another one. And they, you spread them out and you have 52 of these little dolls that you know vary in size all the way down. So like buildings that I've come up with, I have them so that they're able to do that. They're like nesting buildings. So if you have something like this. So here's a building that this is the amount of space that it takes up. But then I can take this, open it here. I've got a big building. Now I've got this building here, and I can take this and put it up here, turn it around. I can take this one, tuck it up against it, and I'm good to go. Or I can pull it out, and then I've got another one. I can tuck that up there like that. Or I can, you know, put it up here, put that up there, put this up here move it around however I want to. So it gives you almost, you know, limitless possibilities of having these things spaced out to create some sort of, you know, building scenario for a city. And the whole thing is able to collapse and tuck away and then you can put it, you know, back underneath your coffee table or in a closet or um, wherever you want to place it. So you got to be creative with this stuff if you want to make your own possible city. This is something that I can take and put on the floor and, and kids can be able to spread them around 
uh, other collectors can be able to, you know, take them, move them around, and it gives them, you know, little little alleyways to be able to have the characters run around in between them, jump from one rooftop to the next. There's all sorts of scenarios for it. So it's it's just a matter of, like I said, being creative with it. And if you have a tight scenario for your collection, I totally get it. Um, just work with what you got. So that's all I've got for you for this episode. But you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, and eBay at Empire Toy Works. See you soon.